name's Ken and I'm a nunchuck instructor as well as a performer. And I wanted to create a video for all you YouTube fans out there that are looking to figure out how do you spin nunchucks. Um, now the style that I want to teach you is not going to necessarily be uh, a combat style. Wham! Wham! We're not going to learn how to hit people with it, okay? The style that I want to teach you has more to do with like juggling and circus tricks and visually stunning moves that you can use to impress people or to create this fluidity of motion to make people wonder like, wow, how does he do that? So it's, this style of spinning is meant to kind of fascinate and make people feel really good when they watch you. Um, I'm also excited because I'm starting a new website called nunchakutricks.com. Now nunchaku is just another word for nunchuck. So if you're used to saying nunchucks, nunchaku is the same thing. It's N-U-N-C-H-A-K-U-T-R-I-C-K-S.com. What I want to do right now is I've seen a lot of videos on YouTube, but I haven't really seen any too many full-length class videos. So what I wanted to do was create a 30-minute class perhaps on how to spin these things, the very basics. And then on nunchakutricks.com, every week on Wednesday, I'm going to release a new video that will help you move along. If you're already an experienced nunchuck spinner, you can also come on and you're going to find some of the more advanced tutorials, kind of like how to do the infinite X catches, throws, all different kinds of really cool combinations, like underneath the arms and spinning it through. But in this uh, tutorial, what we're going to do is we're just going to go through the basics. Now, my favorite type of nunchuck is the fire chucks. But if you're new to nunchucking, probably the best thing to start with are these foam nunchucks, okay? What I've done was I just bought these foams and then I took uh, some electrical tape and I created just kind of a swirl design just because it shows up a little bit better as I'm spinning them. It kind of creates a little bit more of an illusionary pattern than if it was just a standard nunchuck. There's all different kinds. You can start with oak. There's fire chucks, of course, which are my favorite. These are probably some of the most heaviest nunchucks you can get, um, especially with the weighted ends, excuse the Kevlar here, especially with the weighted ends after you soak them. What it's going to do though is it's going to create more momentum. So as I'm spinning them around, uh, the more that I spin these things, the easier it is for it to keep the momentum gliding because the weighted tips just kind of swing it through. So we have those. We also have, for instance, flow chucks from Flow Toys. These are nice. These are extremely lightweight. The balancing point's a little bit different than most chucks, so we'll cover balancing point very soon. I think the most important thing though is when you're first starting out with nunchucks, you could go oak, and that's perfectly okay. Just be really careful because one thing that dissuades a lot of people from, from really learning these things is injury. And if you're spinning oak nunchucks, and say you're learning a tuck, and you clip that part of your elbow right there, after a few times it's going to really hurt. <laughs> really badly. Trust me, this is all experience. The way that I would highly suggest that you learn this is actually to have, well, I mean, my end goal again is using fire nunchucks, but for you, you could start with these and then either move to oak once you get the planes, the spacing down so you don't hit yourself. So get it with this and then also have another pair, oaks, fire nunchucks, glow chucks. Glow chucks would be good for training too. They're extremely lightweight. They're not too, uh, they're not too hard on you at all, like if you hit yourself. Um, but again, I recommend these the most to start with. Because if you hit yourself in the face, bam, you're not going to hurt yourself. But if you have an oak one, you might be taking a nice little nap on the floor for a little bit. <laughs> Alright, so with this, let's get started with nunchuck basics. Now, if we're talking about performance style nunchucks, you're almost always going to hold it up by the chain. You may wonder, well, where, um, where, how high do you hold it? One of the easiest ways to find out where exactly you might hold it is uh, you try to find out where it balances. This is the balancing point. Take two fingers, figure it out, just hold it up here. The balancing point is basically kind of like the center line of a staff. If you think of a staff and there's a center point, this is kind of where you're also going to want to hold it, right about here. If you have longer chucks, the balancing point may be down here. Most often it's up here, but as you get really good with nunchucks, or familiar I should say, you're going to realize that uh, if you're grabbing below the balancing point, it's going to create a different feel. Um, if you grab above it and you do some throws, it may actually cause it to wobble in the air. So first thing you want to do is find your balancing point, like so. And then you're going to take your grip 
and you're just going to put it right in the center of there. This is a good, solid uh, fallback for whenever you want to figure out where to grip. Now, there's two different kinds of grips. We're going to just like get straight into the techniques because I think that's the most fun and even like a little bit of tips, but I definitely want to cover this here. Uh, this is called a front grip. The easiest way to tell is the front grip, if you stick your thumb up, it's going to point towards the chain, okay? Front grip. There's, there's more space up front than there is in the back. You have about this much space in the back, all this space in the front. A front grip. A back grip is the exact opposite. If you stick your thumb up, it should point up to the shorter end of the stick. Uh, it also would be pointing towards the, uh, the wick. A back grip is just basically kind of like the backhand in martial arts. Bam! You know, if you hit someone like that, it'd be the same thing with the chuck. Or if you see those scary movies where they got the knife and like, ring, 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 like that. It's like back grip. You like my sound effects? <laughs> so, front grip, back grip. In most of the cases, we're going to be working with the front grip. So I just want you to kind of take heed and note that. Um, Great, so let's start with some tricks. So there was a lot of moves with nunchucks, and I think that's part of what dissuades people, is, is as you're looking online, there's often like, not a whole lot of step-by-step, -step, well, okay, I learned this move, now what do I do, where do I go next? So what I'm hoping to do with these subsequent videos is to kind of create a path to help you along your way. Um, I'm gonna start with just a few moves here, some of the most basic moves, and. As the videos go on and on, we'll just keep adding more to it and more to it. I want to start with just a simple concept. The concept is, this is a figure eight, and depending on where I stand as opposed to the camera, is going to create a different effect. As if I stand here, if I stand here, or if I stand here. Here you'll notice it looks more like a circle. See? It's like I'm creating a circle here and a circle there. A circle here, a circle there. Here, kind of looks kind of off. I can't quite describe what that is. Somewhere in between a circle and an X, and when I'm standing here, I'm creating an X pattern. Especially if these were on fire, or if these were glowing, you're going to see these slashing X marks. So I think the first thing that I want to go over is, if you ever intend to be a performer, you want to be very aware of something called planes. A planes is like an invisible wall. Like if you were a mime, right now, this camera, as opposed to me, this would be the wall. This is the wall plane, right here. I kind of almost create a two-dimensional space, and I spin along this imaginary wall. So as I'm spinning, I create a lot of circles right here. See that? And you may wonder, well, how can I practice planes at home, or how can I make like this straight wall? Well, anytime someone is watching, wherever you're standing and wherever the, they are, you're going to imagine that you create this perpendicular wall right in between you two. So if you see that person, that's a line, and then you make a perpendicular wall across, and that's going to be like the wall that you're going to spin across. If you're wondering how to, uh, to get it straight too, you can actually practice against real walls. Um, when you're at home, say you're just practicing this upward swing, if you stand against the wall at home, you can just practice moving your hand up and down, trying to keep it as flat as possible. As you'll notice as you go up and down, you're actually going to have to adjust some of the angle a little bit from here to here actually requires a different type of a swing and it's very subtle. And the only way to teach it, well the best way to teach it I should say, is to actually have a physical wall there. And as you get better and better you can even try it in hallways where you have two very close walls and you have to keep it really tight. That will give you a little bit of an advantage when you are recording videos or when you're performing in front of people because what they're going to see are these really elaborate, wonderful circles. Unless you don't want to make circles, but then it's your choice and it's not up to randomness. Without being aware of your planes, you're never going to be quite sure if, if you're creating a circle or an X or something else that may somewhat look sloppy, even though it may not be at all. It just could be your facing. So, with that said, what we're going to do first is we're going to stand over to a corner, like this. For instance, I'm going to look this way. I'm going to take the nunchuck, I'm going to have a front grip, I'm going to touch the opposite side, right here. I'm going to touch the opposite side, so it's going to be my left waist. I'm going to tap it over here, I'm going to tap the right side of my waist, and I'm going to pull it up, like this. So, tap, tap. Now as I pull it up, my left hand is going to reach down here, and we're just going to try to grab it. Now again, we're going to try to grab it in the same point where we grabbed up top, okay? So our, our grip's going to be here. You can grab it down here. It's just, 
in the end, you're going to want to fine-tune it until your hand gets very solidly grabs it around the top of the jug here. So we'll do it again. One, two, grab. Okay? It's actually going to be a simultaneous motion like that. One, two, grab. Now, if you can't get to the, this grab yet, just practice pulling it down and up and catching. Down, up, catch. Down, up, catch. Are we really going to be tapping our hip? Not, not necessarily, but when you first start, you want to kind of get this feel. Once we grab it, our left hand is going to do the exact same thing as our right now. We're going to pull it over to the left side of our hip. I'm going to turn around just so you see. And we're going to pull it up, and our right hand's going to grab it. So we can practice this a few times. Once I grab it here, pulls over to the right side of the hip, pulls it up, catches. Hip, up, catch. Hip, up, catch. I'm going to turn it this way. Hip, up, catch. Hip, up, hip, up, hip, up. Now once you get this flow down, you could spend like 5-10 minutes just working this flow. Once you get it down, stop touching your hip. Now we're just going to roll it up like that. See that? And the way we roll it up is we just don't keep it close to our hip. We just pull it out. And as soon as the rotation, as soon as the rotation is going horizontally, we pull it up vertically. And our hand catches. Now it's like this. Across, up, across, up, across, up, across, up. Now there's one more trick to this move. And that is if you are performing once again, you can add an extra rotation as you're going up. So it'd be across, up, up, across, up, up. Why? Because more circles look better. That's why. <laughs> um, if you're spinning fire, you have circle, circle, circle. It just has a very pleasing effect to the eye because it looks like you're pulling a circle up before you grab it. And then you switch sides. Like that. So now we have this move. And you may only be about this far in it, and that's perfectly okay. Just keep working it until you feel more comfortable and you can put in those spins. Let's say you grab it here, but <clears throat> you don't necessarily want to keep pulling it in the same direction. Now we're going to start working the other direction. So we grab it, but this time our right hand or our left hand, which grabs it, is not going to actually pull it over like this, like we were doing. We're actually going to deflect it and redirect it back this direction. So we'll pull it up. Now all we're going to do is instead of taking it with our left hand, we're actually just going to release it and our right hand's going to shoot it down. Now, as you're shooting it down, what you're actually aiming for is the bottom of your armpit. This is really important to know because you have this bone right here that you can hit and it really hurts to clip it. So as you're shooting it down, pull your elbow out like that. So we catch, see how my elbow comes to the outside? There's no way I can smack that part of the elbow. Here's what it's going to look like. Boom. Okay. Just get, the use, get, get used to feeling it, that catch and then just hitting your armpit. This part right here hits your armpit. If you feel the chain hitting your armpit, keep trying it over and over again until you can feel this part, okay? Once you feel that, we're going to start off really slowly. We're going we're gonna to sink our elbow down. Now you're going to wait until you feel that bounce in your armpit, at least until you can like know how that feels, anticipate that, that feeling, and then you, you clutch it in, basically. We're going to clutch it inward. So. Now we have here, these are the over-the-shoulder passes, grab, clutch, boom. Have your left hand doing something interesting, bam, you know? Um, anytime you stop the nunchuck, it's a perfect opportunity for you to do something with your body, or to turn, or to move. Just bam, turn, boom, or back, bam, turn, you know? Or stop. Get let the audience feel you, or let, or just for your sake, give yourself a, a breather. You know, you you change the tempo a little bit, and people find that really interesting, and, and you get a chance to make it more alive and more dynamic. So now we have this move and this move, right? Uh, I call this a shoulder tuck. How do you get out of the shoulder tuck? Well, this is one of my favorite ways to get out of a shoulder tuck. You pull it forward just a little bit, you'll notice that this creates a triangle right here. See this triangle? Your left hand is actually reaching inside of the triangle, and as you're slightly sliding it out, you're going to open up your armpit, let it clear, and it's going to push out like this. From here, 
We can go into something called figure eights, which we'll get into in a second. Super easy. Or we can just pull it back out into a clutch. Or a tuck. <laughs> Clutches, tucks. I call them the same. Here's another interesting thing. You can practice both sides. So as you start coming out of this, you can shoot it up, go into a figure eight, and catch it with the other side. And do the exact same thing. Take your left hand and push it through. Left hand, push through, move, push through, catch. Move, catch, catch, like so. Okay, so when I describe nunchucks, I usually like to say that you create like these patterns, okay? There's something called figure eights, and usually the figure eights go to the outside, to your left and to your right. And usually in the center are going to be more like uh, rips and very circular centered movements that, that requires uh, hand transitions. But once you go to the outside, it's more like a weavy figure eight X patterns. Doesn't always necessarily require two hands at all. That, and then we're in here, and we're gonna start working just like different hand transfers. And once we're back out here again, it's usually one hand doing some sort of figure eight. So keep that kind of theory in mind that we're gonna create, if we were not to have nunchucks, we're creating big circles here. This one is kind of weaving. You're gonna have two circles here, this side and this side. When we come back here, we have these two circles back here again. And we come here, it's just that one circle weaving back and forth between the front and the back. Um, figure eight is simply, if you take your arm and you just make a big long circle, it's pretty simple, figure eight. You're basically making like uh, a horizontal eight with your arm. Now, there's also a circle that goes behind you this way, like so. As you can notice, think of it like a clock, okay? And every time we hit, um, let's see, every time we're here and we hit 12 o'clock, it's gonna sh it's gonna pull over to the other side of our body. Once we hit 12 o'clock, pulls over to this side of the body. 12 o'clock pulls over to this side. 12 o'clock. So just practice that. Every time you hit 12 o'clock, pull it over like you're slashing a sword. Shoom! I'll stand this direction so you can see. Once we hit 12 o'clock. We're pulling it over to the other side of our body. 12 o'clock slash. Eventually, you'll just be making these slashes, and it looks like an infinity sign or a sideways eight. That's exactly what you want. Now, tighten it a little bit, like this. By the way, you will be burning yourself if you use fire nunchucks like this, because the fire would be like right underneath your arm. So <laughs> that's when you start working something called wrist rolls, which is something that we'll be working on uh, a little bit later. Here, here, here. Now we're going to stop, and we're going to turn it around, and we're going to do it on the other side. Slash, 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 slash. We're missing a couple things, but that's okay. Right now we're working on the outside, these two points, the wings, as I like to call it. We, did, we haven't worked the center yet, but we'll get to that soon. Now, we've got, we've got one that's sloshing downwards, like this, at 12 o'clock. If you do the reverse, if your arm's moving in the opposite direction, it's going to be, be moving up at 6 o'clock and you're slashing upwards. Before, see how we're slashing downwards? If you're doing the reverse figure eight, it's slashing upwards like this. Up. So every time it hits 6 o'clock, it slashes up. 6 o'clock, up. So it looks like this. Or if we're going this direction. Okay. For this direction, up, up. Now, as you can see, there's a circle here and a circle here, and it's just crossing between these two circles, right? Every time we hit 6 o'clock, it pulls up, 6 o'clock, pulls up, 6 o'clock, pulls up, 6 o'clock, pulls up. Here's an interesting thing. If we pull it up at 6 o'clock, and once we hit 12 o'clock, we can turn 180 degrees, okay? And then we can reverse it. Let that sit for a second, okay? So what I'm saying is if I'm doing re reverse here, we're going up at 6 o'clock. The moment I hit 12 o'clock, I can turn this direction, and now I'll do a regular figure eight at 12 o'clock. It'll, it'll move perfectly. So, I'm going in reverse. Every time I hit 6 o'clock, you know, I'm pulling over to the other side. There's 6 o'clock. Pulling it over. Boom, we're at 12 o'clock. I can turn 180 degrees and just start working the forwards. Boom, boom. The opposite is true as well. If I'm crossing over at 12 o'clock while doing my regular figure eight, the moment I hit 6 o'clock, I can turn 180 degrees and go back to the reverse. This should give me 
This should give me access to both of these points while skipping the center point, okay? Which is going to be the next thing that we're going to get into. This may take some time to learn, but I'm telling you, this is like the core because what you're doing is you're opening movement. You're opening your ability to be able to move across a room doing figure eights. Like, you probably may not be able to see this well, but you'll be able to move back and forth with figure eights all the way through. And once we add the wrist rolls, it's going to create so much flair and so much variety. Okay. So we got that basic concept down. You're going to want to be doing your figure eights to the outside, to your left and to your right. Now, none of these are hard set rules. These are just rules to help you get along, to kind of give you a foundation. You can break these rules any time. If you do, though, I would say use a camera and explore and see where it takes you. All right. There's a couple more things I want to go over for this class before we end. One is going to be the wrist roll. The wrist roll is probably the, one of the most important things in nunchucks. Um, there's four different kinds, okay? There's two that are very popular, and then there's two that are slightly a little bit more difficult, but definitely you'll want to learn in the future. The most important ones that you're going to want to learn is the front to back and the back to front. And basically, all that means is a front to back wrist roll starts in a front grip, and we roll it, and then we roll it into a back grip. And vice versa, you're in a back grip, you roll it, and you're into a front grip. So, you're going front to back, front to back, or back to front. Of course, the other two, which we'll get into later, is a back to back and a front to front, which is basically, uh, let me just demonstrate. Here's a front to back. Here's a back to front. The back to back can go infinitely, because you're just starting in a back grip, and you're pulling it into a back grip, see? Back to back, and front to front, front to front. So the last two you can do infinitely, but they're, actually, they're a little bit more difficult. Um, and also, we want to get the back to fronts and the front to backs. Okay. Because once we learn those, we'll be able to do figure eights, and we'll start adding back to fronts and front to backs. And what you'll end up with is a figure eight wrist roll. All right, you want to learn that, right? Because, I mean, once you get that, everything opens up. So here's... Uh, there's two ways that people get into the back to front or the front to back wrist rolls. I'm going to show you the way that I usually get into them, and I use them called, it's called a rip, okay? A rip is basically one hand creates the momentum for the other hand. Like in nunchucks, usually one hand is just creating the momentum for itself, like so. A rip, this left hand, for instance, is going to rip the momentum into it. So you're using one hand to create the momentum for the, for the spin. So the back of your fist, to do a rip, you want the back of your fist, one, to be pointed up towards the sky or your ceiling, and the back of your fist of the other should be pointed down towards the floor, like this. So here's ceiling, floor. The one that's pointed towards the floor, we're just going to pull it up like this. Okay, this is step one. You should see the chain go across the back of your fist like that. Okay, try it again. This one that's pointing towards the floor crosses the back of your fist. Okay, the moment it crosses the back of your fist, you're going to open your hand, and what's going to happen is the momentum pull is going to cause uh, the opposite stick to actually roll in. So here's what it's going to look like in slow motion. I'm going to open my hand, and this stick is going to roll right into my hand, and I'm going to close it. From here, all I do is I twist my wrist 180 degrees, like this. Step one. Step two, open, let the other one fall in. Step three, open, let the other one fall in, and twist your wrist up. And the hand that just pulled it upwards is now going to clasp down. It's four steps, okay? One, two, three, twist it, and then four, this hand grabs down. Watch my left hand now. It just goes up and comes down. It goes up, comes down. The reason why it goes up and comes down is because uh, you'll be able to practice both directions in this way. So, left fist pointing down, right fist pointing up towards the sky. We're going to do it again here. Here we go. Pull up, grab. You'll notice immediately now my left fist is, the back of my fist is pointing up to the sky and my right's pointing down. So we've completely reversed the grip. So now it's turn for the right hand to do the same. And you want to start off again by just pulling the chain. Make sure you can pull the chain right over the back of the fist. And back. Back of the fist and back. Step two, we're going to back of the fist and grab it, like that, okay? So we're going to do it again, back of the fist and grab it. This is probably the hardest part. I will say, like, most people, when they do the wrist roll at first, 
they reach for it, don't reach for it. Let the chuck spin in your hand. There should be practically no movement. If I'm holding the chuck like this, here's what it looks like. Oftentimes what I see though is this. They're reaching for the chuck. They think the chuck is actually going to end up somewhere else, but it's not. Because the chain's wrapping across the back of your fist. It's actually, it's actually, if we were to just hold it very still, you're going to see that this part will naturally fall on this part of the hand. What a lot of happens to a lot of beginners is they reach for it, they slide, they think, they don't think that this part of the chuck is going to naturally fall into their hand. The moment it slides in their hand, they're going to have, what's going to happen is, is the chuck is either not going to like look straight like a stick, it may be like kind of awkwardly shaped, or it may just fly out of their hands. So don't reach for it, just open and close, open, close. Just watch how straight this hand is. See how straight it is? It doesn't reach for it, otherwise the chances are you're going to actually throw off um, what it's intending to do. Kind of a leap of faith. Have a leap of faith. Do it on both sides. Left, right. Left, right. These are called rips. Guess what? You can take your rips, and once you're done with the rip, you can go into your figure eights. So we'll do our figure eights here. Boom. We can, we'll have to like bounce it sometimes, and then we can go to our rips. Like so. And then we're going to roll back, do our figure eights, back to ribs, back to ribs, back to ribs. Now, sometimes you can't, you'll grab it, like as you're doing a forward figure eight to your right, and if you grab it and both hands are facing up towards the sky, that's still perfectly all right. You can choose a hand and rip it up and you'll still have the same effect. Just make sure that your hand rotates over and grabs it again. To cover the other back to front and front to back, you just, you don't use the other hand, you just spin it in a circle like this. This is, what I call this a circular spin. Essentially, what you're going to do is you're going to move your hand in the way of the chain. Once it's about 12 o'clock, you're going to move your hand in the way of the chain and it's going to do a wrist roll automatically. So look, like that. The only problem with this move that I find is it's kind of tricky to keep the momentum going. Like, with the rips, it stops and you can redirect. In this one, you have to find a way to redirect. And we haven't quite gotten to the figure eight wrist roll yet. So what you can do is, once your hand goes up to 12 o'clock and you do the roll, see if you can just keep it spinning like that. And then try it with the other hand. Once it's about 12 o'clock, your hand opens, kind of moves slightly into the way, like this. Right now my hand's this way. Opens, grabs, and then we're going to spin it backwards. Um, once you're in back grip, you're going to have to reverse it, okay? Here's what I mean. If we're doing a front grip here, and we're going counterclockwise with our, or I'm sorry, right hand clockwise, we do the roll, we have to stop it for a second, and then we have to redirect it in order to go back. Like that. With rips, we didn't really have to do much because the hand grabs it and it automatically redirects it. But with these one-handed ones, which you may find easier, some people find rips easier, some people find this easier. It's totally up to you. Whichever one works best for you. But essentially what you're going to want to do uh, is be able to roll it through your wrist, both hands, both directions. And next video, maybe we can get into the figure eight wrist rolls. That'd be great. Um, so again, right now just practice your figure eights here, rotate it figure eight here. As we're doing a reverse figure eight, we can bring this into, the, into effect. Boom, boom. Boom, catch, clutch, boom, hand goes through, hand goes through, boom, and all of a sudden we're doing our figure eights again, and we can move with it, boom, boom, catch, rip, rip, rip. That's all we got right now. But as you can see, it's like, you've got a really good foundation to start with, and we are going to build off that like crazy, and you're going to end up with all these really awesome combos. Now, if you have any more questions, Please feel free to send me a message. My name is Ken Hill, of course. Uh, visit the website, www.nunchakutricks.com. It's going to be your resource to learning these things from beginner to advanced. And again, uh, send me a message, drop me a line, let me know what you think. Happy chucking.
Welcome back to NunchakuTricks.com. This is Ken Hill, and I just want to thank you guys for all your responses and your thoughts about the last video. It was, it was really good. It was a lot better than I anticipated, and uh, it just gives me the energy to keep wanting to do this and to keep pushing it farther and farther along, you know? Um, if you like what you see, please share it. Show everyone you know about it. Tell everyone about NunchakuTricks.com. I want to get... My goal is to get 100 people by the end of this year spinning nunchucks that have never touched chucks before, or maybe they... It's cool if you like used them 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and you just haven't picked them up. My goal is to get 100 people by the end of the year. And I don't even know how I'm going to count that, but there's going to be some way that I'm going to figure it out. Stretching you might not think is very important, but after a really hardcore, intense workout, and I've had them before, when I didn't stretch, I sometimes would get pains in my arms or in my wrist. It's just like if you're typing intensely. Nunchucks, they spin so fast, and your hand is opening and closing in so many, like, so many revolutions per second, even, that uh, if you haven't properly stretched, you could actually cause injury. So, I'm going to show you some very good stretches for nunchucks, okay? These are specific to wrist right now, but what I want to show you are just a few stretches. The first is that you take your pinky finger, like you're going to karate chop your nose, and you're going to put it just like that. Your thumb is going to be pointed forward, pinky finger pointing towards your nose. Your other hand, right now, which is my left, is going to grab the meaty part of, your th of my thumb, like this. My other thumb is kind of planted in the back. My uh, fingers are grabbing the meaty part of the thumb, like so. All I'm going to do is I'm going to try to keep this hand pointed towards my nose, and I'm just going to pull it down like this. And I'll slowly pull it down, trying to keep the hand straight. Okay, again, karate chop the nose, the other hand grabs over and pushes straight down like this. And what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to hold this for at least 10 seconds, I would say 20. For the sake of the video, you don't really need to wait for me. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to count to 20 and then do all these stretches, or this might be long just in the stretching alone. But do keep in mind, you want to chop your nose, chop, grab the meaty part of your hand, and pull it straight down. This is a really good stretch. Okay, you most definitely will want to also do all the other stretches. I'm just doing the wrists this time around. The second one that we're going to do, very simply, we're just going to keep kind of like we're palming the ground, we're going to put it by our waist, and we're going to grab our hand, and we're just going to pull it up like this, like in a gooseneck. We're just going to kind of pull it up like so. We're just trying to put some pressure right here on the back of the wrist. You should not stretch to the point where it hurts, but you should definitely feel something. And when you feel something, you hold it. Because what you're actually waiting for is that feeling that you get about 20 seconds into a stretch, 10 seconds into a stretch. It'll actually feel a little bit different. And then we'll go back down, take the other hand and do it the same. Now watch this. I'm going to take my hand. Now it looks like I'm going to karate chop outward, okay? Before, remember, we were karate chopping our nose. Now we're rotating it all the way down like this, okay? So my thumb is pointing towards my stomach. I'm going to grab it backwards just the same. So my right hand is pointing towards my stomach, and my left hand is pointing towards the, uh, the camera, okay? So again, like this. This hand grabs the opposite direction. This is a really good stretch. You're basically going to pull this hand up to your chest, and you're going to rotate it like a crank. This hand is going to slowly pull your hand over like this. Think of it like a crank, okay? The motion is pulling your fingers up this direction. All right, it's going to put pressure, or it's going to stretch out this part, this part right here of your wrist. I learned this from uh, a long time ago. I went to a martial arts dojo. And they had 18 different instructors, so we had all different kinds of styles. And this one, I believe, was from Aikido. Don't quote me on that. It was one of those stretches I learned a long time ago, and uh, I just kept it with me. And then as I spun nunchucks, I realized how important they were. Now, of course, those are, some, those are three really good stretches. You, you all, of course, want to do your shoulder stretches because you're going to do a lot of shoulder movements. You even want to practice your, your, uh, your kicks and your punches and you're, you know, doing the splits, going down, things of that nature. I'll probably create some sort of stretching video in the future, but for now, work on those three stretches. The three stretches, again, are karate chop your nose, pull it down like that, 
Okay, palms should be kind of facing this direction. The other one was pull it straight up like this and hold it. And then the last one was chop to the outside, grab, pull it up that direction. Stretches are going to be really good, really good, right before and after you, you get done with an intense spin. You may not feel it right away, or you may not even feel like you need it right away, and you might not. But in the end, when you're going fast and furious, your wrist will thank you so much <laughs> for it. One thing that uh, we'll use Bruce Lee, he used to talk about a conservation of energy. And he would be talking about how athletes would... Uh, as they became more experienced, they would actually be a lot more relaxed in their movements because they knew like which specific muscles needed to move so you could be an efficient machine. And in the beginning, uh, athletes, when they first start training, can sometimes be more tired because they're using too much muscle. There's too much tenseness. And so in your nunchuck training, what you want to be aware of is what's tensed, what's tightened, what needs to be tightened, and what doesn't. If you think of a belt and you whip a belt, you know, it's very loose, but it's very snappy at the same time. It has a sharpness to it. Nunchucks are kind of the same way. You want to be very loose, but there is just a little bit of tension in it. And it's not in your other hand. I repeat, it's not in your other hand. <laughs> Which brings me to... A lot of us call it dino hand. And what dino hand is, is when you have the nunchucks and you're working fast and furious, what happens to this hand is there's so much concentration in the chucks, you don't even realize your hand will start to clench up like a dinosaur and it'll like go right here, like a T-Rex, like right there. So they'll be spinning and the, their hand will just attach like this, like, dear God, what happened? I don't know, it was a terrible accident. But it goes away when I stop spinning nunchucks, which is great. You don't want people to think that you're, you know, <laughs> to think that. So what I want you to focus on is loosening up. Every time you feel tension, it, it could be in your hands, it could be in your legs even, remind yourself that as you're spinning you need to be loose, like a belt. And it snaps at the end. Even as I'm spinning nunchucks, fast and furious, my hand is very loose. It's very loose. Because if I tensed it up, it would actually cause it to go against uh, the momentum that I'm creating. So, just watch your dyno hand. And if you don't have it, or if you don't think you have it, record yourself just to make sure. And see if, as you're spinning fast and furious, if your other hand starts to crunch up or cramp up or just up, up here at your chest or stomach level. You may be surprised. So I just want to go over one more thought before we start our lesson, and it's the theory of mistakes. Um, it's like, I'm learning a new move, and uh, oh, ah, I dropped it. Why? Why, God, did I drop it? Oh, you know, you scream and curse the gods or whatever you do. Um, and maybe you try it ten times, and you drop it, and he's like, I just can't get this move. There's just, I'm just not good enough. Or a lot of times people think of mistakes as a good reason to not start anything new. They think they're, like for instance, I've heard this a lot of times, I'm not coordinated enough. And I'm thinking in my head, well you can't be if you haven't tried. I mean you have to build that coordination. You know, that's what I'm thinking, but I don't say it of course. Um, a lot of it has to do with just the way that you perceive a mistake. And the way I see it is, it's a stepping stone. And it's usually a necessary stepping stone. Sometimes you have to look ridiculous. You have to be okay with looking foolish and ridiculous because that's gonna like, they're like arrows that point you to the way that it should be done. It's, it's a little bit of intuition and it's a little bit of creativity and it's a little bit of just really going out there and, and breaking that mold so you can create something that's authentic and that's yours. So my theory is this, it's the 100 drops more like a hypothesis, I guess. Basically, if you haven't dropped it a hundred times for that move, then you can't discount it yet. Now, as you're going through those hundred moves, you may need to modify, sure. You may need to look at yourself each time and adjust how you're doing it. But in the end, if you give it a hundred tries, which is quite a bit, but if you give it a hundred tries, you're gonna discover it. And what's more important about just getting that one move is not necessarily the technique because in the end when we're spinning you're gonna realize it's not about the individual techniques just like if you watch a dancer it's not about the individual techniques of that dancer 
but it's it's how they string them together and the theory and all the the laws that they've created and the the mechanics and the foundations that they can use to weave something to create something amazing uh, so that's what I want you to see too because you may you may be learning a move that you won't use very much at all, but it may actually give you the insight to create a whole slew of new moves that you would absolutely love. So you have to give it a chance though, and you have to try it a lot. It's that stubbornness and that determination and the adaptability that will take you and give you your own voice instead of the voice of others. And what I mean by the voice of others is simply, it's like this. What I'm trying to teach you right now is the art that I understand, but I want you to take that, I want you to modify that, and I want you to find mistakes, and I want you to go with it, because those mistakes are going to take you on your journey, and it's going to give new moves, and we're going to get new techniques and new styles, and that's what I want to see, because uh, the world has me already, but the world doesn't have you. When I am doing my over-the-shoulder passes, right now, I'm passing to two lanes. And these are the outside lanes. There's a lane here, and there's a lane here. So, here, see? That lane to the left. Now the lane to the right. There's one that's directly in the center of you as well. And if I do my figure eights, what I may do is may cut my body in half, and it's going to roll right in that lane right here. So, outside lane to my right, inside lane, right here, right in the center. So as I do my figure eights, well, boom, up, boom, up. So now as I do my over-the-shoulder passes, I'll just add a figure eight. Okay? Figure eight, up, figure eight, up, figure eight, up, figure eight, up. Slow motion again. Once I grab it, once I grab it, outside, center, up, outside, center, up, outside, center, up. See that? Outside, center, up. So practice that a few times. What you can do to practice it, you already know the over-the-shoulder pass, and you should know the reverse figure eight already. Practice your reverse figure eight, but don't go through your body. Don't go through the other way now. We're just going to break it in half right here. We're going to stop the second swing here instead of to the outside. So, be careful of the fire because the fire is going to be right in your face. But as you go towards the middle lane right here, your other hand can catch it. The moment you catch it, the hand that was uh, using it before is going to flick it in the air and give it the momentum. Just like how we use the rips. You remember how the rips flick it in the air like this? Well, this time, I'm going to grab it, flick it in the air. I'm going to use that as a momentum to create the other figure eight. So the right hand is going to do your figure eight. It's kind of going down the center. We're going to grab it. Okay, here's what it'll look like right here. Boom, right there. You don't want to get too close, you're going to hit your head. This is why we use foam right now. So be sure you have your hand extended out and feel the distance that you need to be. And right there. Um, again, the best way to practice is to simply grab it and do it over again until you can feel really comfortable. Reverse figure eight, grab. If you're not grabbing right or if it bounces off, oh no, just keep trying it until you can get that feel. It's right here. If you don't grab it, just go back to that reverse figure eight and do it again until you can grab it. Once you grab it, this hand to the outside flings it up, and then you're doing a reverse figure eight with the other hand. Again, once we come towards the center, grab, other hand, flicks. Grab, flicks. Grab, flicks. Grab. Eventually what you'll do is you just go straight in one pattern, like this. See? So now, we can do this. Up, over, up, over, up, over, up, boom, boom, up, boom, up, boom, up, boom, up. Or, we can go here and do it. This center line grab here. So we're doing the reverse figure eights again. I just wanted to show this to you just so you know. You can omit the figure eights and just do pure center line grabs as well. 
straight through. And all that is, is the hand is pushing it through one revolution and catching it. Push it through, catch. The hand that's in the back pulls to the front, and then it becomes the launching point. So, here, boom. Now this is like an over-exaggeration. You're actually only giving it one revolution in slow motion. For now, we're just going to, we can realize that you can take the figure eight and pull it straight into the clutch. Which also means, when we're doing this move here, let's say I'm over here, I'm doing my over-the-shoulder passes, boom, 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 and I clutch it, you can go straight into the forward figure eight from the clutch. It moves very simple, because that's the direction it's going to be going anyways. So, from the forward figure eight, as we're in the front figure eight, clutch, and go back to figure eight. Clutch, go back, clutch, go back, clutch, go back, boom, boom. Both hands, of course. Boom, boom, okay? Just, it launches straight over. Where it's gonna launch, where it's gonna launch once you have the clutch, this is gonna, it's almost gonna be like a slash down, right there. That's how it's gonna start. So, back, back. Here it's gonna, it's gonna go straight like that. Wham! 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 Right there. Boom! 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 Oh, we're in the reverse now. We can go up and we can do the middle grab. I want to work the figure eight wrist roll. This is probably one of the most important wrist rolls that you'll ever learn. And I'm just going to work the front one right now. We're going to start with our right hand. And we're going to do the standard figure eight, okay? Now remember, every time we're at 12 o'clock, we're, we're slashing over to the other side. 12 o'clock, slash. 12 o'clock, slash. So 12 o'clock, slash. I'm going to add one more time signature, which is 6 o'clock. Every time you're at 6 o'clock, you're going to do a hand roll. Here's how we're going to start it off. We're going to extend our hand like this, and we're just going to start with the basic wrist roll, or this basic uh, circular spin. And we're going to cross our body. So I'm using my right hand. I'm crossing my body over to the left. And once it hits 6 o'clock, I'm going to do the wrist roll. Now, the wrist roll is going to put me into a back grip. So this may be a little bit different than a figure eight. What we're going to do, once we, uh, once we accomplish the 6 o'clock, is our hand's going to come over, and it, it's going to be in a back grip. And we're going to slash it down across. And once it hits 6 o'clock again, we're going to do the wrist roll, which should take it to the front grip. Now, if you don't know what a wrist roll is, just remember that we uh, covered that in the, last, in the last class, that's where you're taking the chain and you're wrapping it around the back of your fist. And it looks like this, very slowly. Step one, the chain goes over the back of the fist. Step two, after it goes over the back of the fist, you open your hand, and your hand, immediately this will fall into your hand from the momentum, and this should roll over. Usually I said, well, there's nothing else you can do after that, because then you have to stall it. Then you have to stall it if you want to go the opposite direction, unless we learn the infinites, which we'll get into later. But if you go to the wrist roll, what happens is, when it's at its point where it would have been stuck, you're slashing it over to the other side, which causes everything to 180 over. Now that everything's inverted, we can do the other wrist roll with ease, and that's what causes it to where you can continually do those two wrist rolls back and forth because every time we switch 180 degrees, the law is every time you switch 180 degrees, everything reverses. So, we'll try this again. We're slashing down, we're slashing down. As soon as we start to come up, which is 6 o'clock, wrist roll, slash down, wrist roll, slash down, wrist roll, slash down, wrist roll. If that's difficult, Try this, give it three rotations first. So we'll go one, two, three, slash and a wrist roll. And then one, two, three, slash and a wrist roll. One, two, you get it, right? Three, slash and a wrist roll. Keep doing that. Eventually, what you should come up with is something that looks like this. Looks kind of sloppy right now, and that's okay. We're going to tighten it up after that. Soon you won't use your hands so big. You won't be swinging so big. 
All you're going to do is just let it swing over, straight over like this. Um, I kind of put an extra beat in my wrist rolls, probably from Poi, but just so you know, it may look slightly different. It should look more like, oh man, it's so hard to do without that extra beat. <laughs> just so you know, I usually put an extra beat with my wrist roll, so if you see that extra inward swinging out, that's just because I like circles. Um, you totally don't have to add that in, but if you do, you have an extra circle right there. Wrist roll, wrist roll, slide it through. If you don't, it'll look like this, which is still fine. Oops. It's really hard for me to do that move. I'm like so conditioned to do it the other way now, it's hilarious. But if you add that extra beat, what'll happen is, well, you create more circles, which is always a good thing. <laughs> We're also going to do it standing forward. Um, but before we do it standing forward, you got to do it with both hands, don't forget. So we're going to do it with our left hand. We're going to be doing our circular spins. We're going to cross it over, wrist roll. Slash it down, wrist roll. So keep in mind, we start here. Every time we cross it down, we wrist roll. Every time we hit 12 o'clock, we cross it over and we wrist roll it again, okay? So 12 o'clock, cross. 6 o'clock, wrist roll. Put my hand down. Because I can't explain this enough. This may be really hard to get at first, and that's perfectly all right. Um, for some people, it takes months. It actually takes months. For some people, it may take hours. But no matter what it is, it does take time to build this. Just remember, 12 o'clock, cross. And then do this, wrist roll, cross, wrist roll, cross, wrist roll, cross. Usually, the wrist roll that I use is when I'm standing facing the wall plane, which is where our ribs are coming from. And the wrist roll that I use, standing forward, we're going to do the same thing, except for it's coming across the hip like so. Now this may be a very strange place to be if you're not used to it. So you may want to spin in front of a wall first to practice your figure eight this direction. Um, the trick to getting a good figure eight at the hip is actually the upward lift in the back, okay? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use my right hand and we're going to go clockwise in the front. So it's going to move clockwise in the front. Once it hits 12 o'clock, we're going to move it in the back. Now the trick to the movement in the back is you don't have a whole lot of rotation when your arm's behind your back, so you lift your arm up like this. Lift. I'm over-exaggerating it to kind of show you. So as soon as I make 12 o'clock and it goes to the back, I'm lifting my arm up. And that upward lift from 6 o'clock is what's going to give it enough momentum for that rotation to go. That's an exaggeration. It's really a very subtle kind of push in the back. What you should look like is this. Once you hit 6 o'clock here, we'll do a front-to-back wrist roll. And once we get to the back, we're going to do a back to front. So, front to back, back to front, front to back, back to front, lift. Front to back, back to front, lift. Front. Remember that's where that lift is, front to back, back to front, lift. Like that. Be able to do both hands. I'm not going to go over this and break it down like I did the other one, because it's exactly the same technique sideways, except this time we're bending it around while we're standing into this wall plane, which is the plane where you're facing the camera or the audience. So, front to back slash, back to front, as I hit the wall, <laughs> lift, front to back, back to front, lift, front to back, back to front, lift, front to back, back to front, lift. Now, once you get comfortable with that, do it with the other side, front to back, back to front, lift. You guys, do not feel bad if it takes you the entire week to get, to get the figure eight wrist roll. Feel good if you can get it in three weeks. If you can get it in one week, that's amazing. You should feel great. If you can get it in a couple hours, you're insane. You're awesome. Okay? You want to be able to do the figure eight wrist rolls more than any other move because that is the move that will save you when you're spinning fire chucks. That's the move that will cause the most rotations and the most spins. The reason why the figure eight wrist roll is good in fire chucks is because the hardest part about fire chucks is you have the fire that's underneath your arm. So you have to keep it in motion uh, for the uh, comets of fire. What's going to happen is they're going to spin around each other. So you don't have the same part of the stick. You just change the stick, and you just change the stick again, and you just change the stick again. So it's moving it in a fast enough rotation to where the comets are chasing each other, kind of like a dog chasing its tail. And that's, that's kind of where you want to be, especially when you first start fire chucks. 
Um, even if you're not using fire chucks, it just the effect of the rotations into itself is part of the biggest reasons why you would choose uh, nunchucks over other props. So practice those figure eight wrist rolls all the time until you can do it in your sleep. Next class we'll work on reverse figure eight wrist rolls. If you have any questions about figure eight wrist rolls, please feel free to contact me. I'll make another video if we have to, but this is the core of what you need to know and perhaps the most important technique because so much builds off of it. So we've gone over vertical spinning a lot. And what I mean by vertical is we have this wall and we're like spinning across it and we're under it, boom, 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 you know? Well, we didn't really learn that part, but I'm just kind of showing you that there's this invisible wall right here that I'm spinning across this whole time. Chucks are moving up and down vertically. Um, I haven't really gone over the, the horizontal motion too much. Horizontal motion would be more like like this. That motion. Across. Across your body. Now the advantages of going across your body is let's say I have two cameras or audience that's all the way around me. If I'm performing for these people or if my audience is there or if I have two cameras and I'm spinning in this motion here, well it's gonna look great in front of that camera over there. But what about that camera here? It doesn't look so good anymore. Boom. I mean, it's alright. It, you can still see it. But it doesn't look the same as if I was standing in front of here. But if I'm using horizontal movements, well, both, both of them can still catch it a little bit better. Both sides. Even though I was facing that direction and performing for that side, whew, <laughs> that side still gets a little bit sorry. It's a little intense here. So we're going to be doing this move here over the shoulder passes, like so. Boom, 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 boom. Touch up, touch up, touch up. And this time, um, instead of passing it down, you know how we would go straight to the clutch? Well, we're not going to go to the clutch this time. We're going to slash down and we're going to cross our body this direction. Boom! So if I'm using my right hand, which I tend to teach a lot using the right hand, you can use your left too. Right hand slashes across to the left side of your hip. Like that. Now what's going to happen is I'm going to touch it to my hip, so this thing just kind of needlessly bounces on the, against my back. It's not going to hurt at all, as long as I don't hit myself with this part. See, the most dangerous part of the chuck is right here. If you play with these insides, you're not going to hurt yourself. Like that. So as long as you remember, this is your safety zone. Keep all of your, this is called a bounce. A bounce is like this. A bounce is any time it bounces off the body. It's called a bounce. It's bouncing off my body every second of the moment. Just bounce, bounce, bounce. If I'm hitting it at the very end, especially with fire chucks or wood chucks, you are going to bruise yourself and hurt yourself really quick, possibly break bones, knock yourself out, and possibly be dead. So, I'm kind of exaggerating, but just know that you want to make sure that you're using this part, okay? So we're going up, 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 bounce. Next thing we're going to do, we're going to roll it all the way across and we're going to bounce it 360 degrees. This is so you can get used to this bounce. Your hand is going to swing all the way across and bounce over and it's going to bounce off your stomach this direction. You'll notice the chain actually wraps around your stomach. So, like this, bounce, bounce, the last part of it is we're going to rip it past so we're back to the same side and we're going to make an X. The first part of the X slashes up like this, it's going to go around our neck and the second part is going to slash down and this is going to be the most fierce part of it, it's like, like that. And the slash. Now you don't want to do it that fast when you're first working it, but you will eventually, and I'll tell you why in a second. It's going to slash across, and again we're going to touch this to our hip. This is where it began. As long as the chain hits our hip, it doesn't matter, it's not going to hurt us. Make sure you have nothing in front of you. Especially people. Because that's a knockout blow. <laughs> so, up, 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 up. Here we go. One. Cross the bodies. Two. Three. 
again. Up, 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 up. One. Cross the bodies. Two, three, four. Okay? One. Cross the bodies. Two. I'm going the opposite direction, by the way. Three, four. Now, this is um, awesome if you're using a fire chuck because if you only have one side that's lit, this is usually how I put my chuck out. I think it's just a great way. So I'm spinning my chucks and, uh, oh god, only one side's lit. So I'm going to hand roll to get that side over here. You know, because hand roll reverses which stick you're grabbing. And then I might go here, here, over, and slash! It's done! See ya! Now, we're going to add one more element to this movement. We're doing our over the shoulders. And one. Two. This time when we go over the head, we're going to spin with it. So, three is going to look like this. It's going to move up, and our hand can even match it, but we're going to spin 360 degrees, and then we're going to slash it. Again. One. Two. This time, as three comes up, we're actually going to pull it over our head like this. We can use our hand. We don't have to use our hand. I tend to use my hand. Three will look like this. Four will slash it out. Okay? We're going to get into movement a lot more in the future videos. Movement is so important with nunchucks. These are such a small, like, prop. If you don't move, let me give you an example, okay? I'm going to show you what happens if you don't, like, put very much focus on movement. You can get a freestyle that looks like this. Not bad, right? Hmm. Or you can move with it. Bam! And just that extra motion. I mean, even if I'm just doing wrist rolls, just that extra motion and clutch. Bam! It gives it energy and fierceness and dynamics, and we can slow it down. And then we can speed it back up with that. And then we can slow it down. And speed it back up, you know? That's what we want. Like, we want it to be alive. Um, thanks again for watching. Please, please tell your friends, tell everyone you know that has ever thought about nunchucks or picked it up at one time about this series of videos, and hopefully it'll relight that fire under them. Um, like I said, i got to make my goal of 100 new spinners. That's a lot. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot for uh, new spinners, for sure. That's a great goal to have. Um, if you have any questions at all, of course, my YouTube account, Ken Hill, you're probably on it right now, if not, uh, we've got a Facebook page, and definitely don't forget nunchakutricks.com. N-U-N-C-H-A-K-U-T-R-I-C-K-S.com. That place is going to have uh, competitions eventually. We're, we're working on like getting all kinds of new material. I'm thinking about a belt testing system, which would be awesome. It'll pitch you against many different uh, challenges that you'll have to submit to go up into your next belt. Uh, we also have... Um, discussion forums and it's it's just a site that's building and you're going to be able to meet other comrades that also spin chucks and you guys can share videos become friends etc etc uh also just want to say again figure eight wrist rolls figure eight wrist rolls figure eight wrist rolls don't stop doing them until you can do them in your sleep because once you get those we have so much more to show you i mean I haven't gone over the reverse yet or the hyper style or snake style or movements, or redirects, we have so much to cover, and once we cover those, we're going to go about two more levels deep after that. to nunchakutricks.com. Ken, it's good to see everyone again. We're at number three. Uh, you should feel really good. We've made it to the third session. That means you've watched, what, like an hour of videos? That's pretty good, pretty good. And I can't even imagine how much you've trained, hopefully that long, or at least longer. <laughs> um, 
I just want to thank you guys for watching these videos and sharing and sharing your comments. I mean, it, it really means a lot to me to, uh, to see all my hard work coming back at me in terms of the view counts going up and the minutes watched. And I, I get to see like all my stats kind of go up to, to see how much interest there is for this. Uh, you know, it just keeps me going. Um, this is the conclusion to our beginner series. Now, that doesn't mean that you know all of the beginning moves, but the foundations you should have. So, we just got a few things to catch up on and to touch up on. And yes, I consider the figure eight wrist rolls, even though it's more of an intermediate move, it's such a foundation that I, I just included it with the beginner series. If you can't get it yet, that's okay. Um, just keep working them. And if you have any questions at all, I can make subsequent videos to help you if you have any problems with that. Keep in mind, uh, nunchakutricks.com, again, N-U-N-C-H-A-K-U-T-R-I-C-K-S.com. I mean, it's going to have links to the Facebook page, to the YouTube page, if you don't know it already. Um, and there's going to be a lot of exclusive material coming around the corner that you can only find on that site. So I wanted to tell you about what I'm working on after this last big beginner tutorial, we're going to start working on like more focused areas. For instance, like I'll be working on um, throws or under the leg passes or how to move when you're spinning. And it's again, it's going to be released every Wednesday at 8 o'clock. Now if you feel ambitious, if you feel like you want more training, I'm creating something called Ninja Training. And all Ninja Training is, is at the cost of a cup of coffee per month, uh, I'm going to release a second video on Saturday. So what that means is you'll get a video release on Wednesday and a video release on uh, Saturday. With ninja training, um, it's not going to be material that you're not going to learn without it. It's just going to be twice as much material. So in the first month, um, most people are going to have four videos, right? But you'll have eight, which means you'll see, you already know next month's videos for everyone else. And in four months, you'll have eight months of videos. And it just goes on and on. It's going to still release in the same order. So as you're going through your ninja training, you're already going to know what's around the corner for everyone else. So if you've enjoyed the videos, I mean, there's no way you can lose because even if you aren't ninja training, you're still going to be getting the videos. But if you're serious about nunchucks and you want to just keep this going at a faster pace or you just can't stop absorbing the new moves, highly recommend that you uh, get ninja training. It's like five bucks. It's like the cost of coffee. And it'll help pay for my website, it'll help pay for some of the costs of, of making this, and for future contests, and for many other things. So, really consider it. Now, I've kind of thought about different ways that people can train, and basically, I've nailed it down to about three different states. Three states of training. The first state, of course, is what I call the train state. And the whole focus of the train state is to optimize. Um, what you're doing right now when you're watching me and you're trying to replicate what I do, I would consider to be the train state. If you're working on your move and your planes are off, that's the train state. You're trying to focus, you're going to optimize, you're going to sharpen it up. So if it's a little bit wobbly, you're going to keep working on it until it's nice and straight. You know, or if you don't catch it right and you keep working on it, that's the train state. Um, most of the time, most people are working in the train state because that's how we learn. We'll watch a video and we'll try to replicate it, or we'll watch ourselves and we'll say, well, okay, I can do this a little bit better. So think about how often you spend in the train state, because you also want to uh, consider the other two states as well. The second one is the play state. Now in the play state, this is kind of like if you think of a giant blackboard and you are a mad scientist and you're scribbling all your theories and your thoughts and ideas and half of them don't work and you're dropping and you're making mistakes, well, now you're in the play state, and that is basically you're playing around with theories. And I say the word theory a lot, but that's because I think there's a lot of concepts that you can like put together and see if it fits. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. Um, so when you're in the play state, this is basically where you're trying to find a way to innovate your style. Innovate it. So training, you're optimizing it. Playing, you're innovating it. You're you're creating maybe signature moves or you're expanding what you can do. Like, for instance, what if we bent the plane with a certain move? Or what if I did a turn? Or what if I did a jumping turn with the same thing? We're not really working on getting it to look perfect. We're just trying to see if what's possible. Once you figure out what's possible, you may take that move and move it over to the train state so you can optimize it and make it look as awesome as possible. 
So now ask yourself, well, how, many, how long do I spend in the play state? Generally speaking, you may want to just think about how often you spend in the train state and how often you spend in the play state, because both of those combined is going to create a really awesome aspect of your style. And probably one of the most important states is the flow state. And I call it the state of flow because this is like, this is like how you put it all together. If you'd like to think of spinning, think of it like I'm teaching you words and the flow state is how you use that to create a story. This is your energy. This is the way you communicate it. This is like your transitions between moves. So it doesn't look just like you're moving from technique to technique, but it actually looks like you're creating and you're communicating something. Like when you watch, I always like to say dance because the, it's not really about moving from technique to technique, as I've said in the past. It's more about just creating a story. So your flow state is how well connected you are to yourself and how well you can connect to the audience in the sense of creating a story or an atmosphere or taking them away. Um, how do you train the flow of state? That's really simple. Play your favorite music and see how you can lose yourself. Once you get lost in your state of flow and you're not thinking about optimizing and you're not thinking about um, innovating, but you're just feeling it and you're just moving with the flow, you're probably in the flow state right there. You're just completely lost in the moment. So think about how often you're in the flow state. How often are you in the play state? How often are you in the train state? Can you kind of balance them out so you can kind of create the mixture of your style? It's almost like these elements are going to create um, what you're eventually going to be like as a performer or as a spinner. Let's say you've been spinning for a month straight and you feel like, God, I plateaued. I can't figure out why I can't get any new moves. Well, you might be spending too much time in one of the states. For instance, maybe you're too much, you, maybe you're optimizing all your moves too much and you haven't spent enough time just playing or just flowing, you know? And if, if you spend too much in one of the states, that's often a time when we do feel like we've plateaued or hit the top because we keep doing the same thing over and over again. Even if we're playing a lot, um, if we don't train it, it may not ever become a part of our flow. You know, We may not actually incorporate it. So we're seeing all these new moves, but at the same time, we're not actually incorporating it. So all the possibilities are there, but we haven't actually worked it into our system. So think of the three states, and again, if you, feel, if you ever feel stuck, think if you're neglecting any of those three, and chances are you, you probably are. Keep that in mind, because that might actually keep you moving forward the whole time when you think you, know, you might not be. So let's get down to techniques. I want to start with uh, our over-the-shoulder passes. You remember this. This is from the very beginning of the videos. We're going to work on something called the behind-the-neck pass, and it looks like this. Boom, right there. The trick to this move is it's all guts. And what I mean by all guts is you're putting this up by your shoulder. And as long as you swing it in a straight line and you follow through, it's going to work. If you hold back at all or if you don't swing it in that line, it's usually going to tap you in your shoulder instead. Um, as always, uh, since the check's going by your face, it can feel a lot scarier and make you hold back. But it's actually the holding back that's going to stop you from doing this move. So let me show you how it works. So we're doing our over-the-shoulder passes, like so. Usually we've been standing off to the side when we're doing it. But I'm doing it here to demonstrate so you can see it. We're going to tap our hip, go up to our shoulder like this. But instead of our hand grabbing underneath like we would be doing, so our right hand is going over, our left hand is going to actually cross by our cheek instead of grabbing down here. So here by the cheek instead of down grabbing here. This protects your face from ever being hit. Now, this hand, I'm going to put this down for a second. You're thinking of two things. One, you're thinking of drawing a very straight line across, okay? It's probably right around the nose level. So, right around the nose level, it's very horizontally. The part two is you're reaching all the way across. If I turn around, it almost looks like I'm, well, I am. I'm touching the back of my neck with my hand. I'm actually feeling that connection. Now you don't have to later on, but when you're first starting and getting the feel for this move, you're going to want to actually touch the back of your neck. See this? It needs to follow through this much, at least when you first start out. It needs to follow through that much in order for it to, to cross itself all the way over. This hand is going to be open, and it should be catching it. So, hand up, step one, swing all the way across, step two, touch it by your neck, and follow through. 
if you're hitting your shoulder like this, it's either one of the other one of those two things. Um, first, make sure that it's straight across like this. For instance, if I do the throw from here and it comes upwards at an angle, it's going to keep traveling in that straight line only inversed behind me. So what we want to make sure is it's very horizontal like that. That way, as you can see, as my hand stops, the momentum's just going to keep going in that same direction. So just make sure that your line is straight across. Boom, right there. Okay, number two is make sure you don't hold back. Like, for instance, if you're too far out here, the chuck may not have enough space to clear. Um, it may be really scary, so you hold it back here. Maybe you're not throwing it hard enough because you're like, oh god, it's going to hit my face. But here's what I say, make sure it hits your face. <laughs> I mean, when you swing in it, that's what you want it to do, except for your hand's going to be in the way, so you know it's not going to hit your face. But if you're thinking, I'm going to hit my face, that's what I want to do, it's going to go straight into your hands. Um, if you can't get the grip yet, remember you can always just hold your hand open and just let it bounce until you can feel it and grab it. But that's essentially the behind the neck. And then your other hand grabs it, and then you can do, you can go to the same side that grabs it. So if I grab it with my left, I'm going to take it out of my left, and we're going to pull it back up. So hip, up, hip, up, hip, up, swing across. Hip, up, hip, up. Anytime we can swing it across both directions. Here. Here. Whoops. Oh, I missed that one. But you get the point of it. Um, do it both sides, both directions, and you should be good. So I'm really big on being able to turn and to move, and I know we haven't worked a lot of those yet, but that's all coming down, you know, in the upcoming um, episodes. But I do want to show you this, because this is a foundation of movement that I find. The concept is simply a standard circular spin, either it's going clockwise or counterclockwise, and we want to be able to move with it. Okay? From Those are actually two different spinning movements that you can use, and if you practice with both your hands, you should be able to spin the chuck anytime you're in a front grip, you should be able to turn anytime. And all you have to do is learn two moves and be able to do it with your right and with your left. Here's how it looks. The first move is like this. Let's say I grab it with my right hand and I am spinning it counterclockwise like so. Both of these moves you may want to use a wall because the wall will help you with your planes. You want to have very straight planes when you do this. So let's say I'm standing towards a wall. You may want to do this. Remember we were talking about this earlier, how you're practicing how to spin the chuck because as you're standing down here there's actually quite an, uh, it's very subtle but it's definitely an adjustment for how you have to spin up here as opposed to here, as opposed to here. <laughs> so. Um, your first move is going to look like this. We're going to take the chuck in our right hand and we're going to spin it this direction. Okay, It's going to go uh, counterclockwise. Next, we're going to turn 180 degrees and then we're going to do a pass. Now there's two ways to do this pass. Let me show you the recommended pass, the way that I prefer. It's a same stick grab like this. Essentially both my thumbs are pointing down this hand is going to grab, my, the hand that's grabbing is slightly above the other one, so when I let go, this hand will continue the spin, like that. Let me show you again. Here, turn, keep the same direction, you're just turning your body, but you're not stopping this. And as this hits here, which will be 9 o'clock, um, when I'm looking at it from my direction, 9 o'clock, it's swinging down, and the other hand grabs it. The reason why I prefer the same stick grab is because it adds an extra rotation. As you notice, see that? The momentum itself causes it to rotate on its own. Now, this may be a little bit harder than this one, which is the uh, opposite stick. See how I'm grabbing the opposite stick? That's why it's called an opposite stick pass. <laughs> the opposite stick, but then it stops. So it doesn't quite have as many rotations, so I always like more rotations, of course. I just think this tends to have more of an effect. But you can totally do the same move by doing the, uh, the opposite stick grab. So, we're spinning it counterclockwise with our hand, we're turning, we're going to pass, we're going to turn, and finally we're going to return it back to our original hand. Now, the hardest part to this move, obviously, is going to be this pass. So let me show you a way that you can practice this, no matter what pass it is, whether it's the opposite stick grab or the same stick grab. This is a good way to work your planes. First, of course, you can use the wall here. You want to make sure that this doesn't touch the wall. 
The nice thing about a wall is you can start off farther away from the wall and as you get better and better, get closer and closer to the wall so you have to keep it much tighter without hitting it. Um, if you want to just practice, well how can I just get really good at spinning in the back plane? I'm going to show you this exercise. It works really well. So we're standing with our right hand spinning counterclockwise. We're going to turn the 180 degrees. We're going to do the pass, but instead of turning around, we're going to lift it up and we're going to lift our shoulder. Now if you look at it, my elbow is actually perpendicular to the way I'm facing. Okay? Now I'm turning my head a little bit just to make it a little bit easier, otherwise it's a really awkward stretch. So here's what it looks like. My elbow is pointing, it's kind of pointing right at the camera. So if there was a wall here, I'm doing my spin, the tip of my elbow could touch the wall right here. This is a bounce point basically. Here. And I'm creating a bend so the nunchuck actually stops its momentum and it goes the opposite direction. Once I do that, I can practice the pass with my left hand and then once again point my elbow out and I let it bounce this direction. We rotate the direction, spin it, bounce, 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 bounce. This is really good for working the planes behind your back because if you miss it, you won't be able. It won't hit. You know. You won't be able to bounce it. Of course, if you're too far, um, or if it's off a little bit, it's not going to bounce off the back of your tricep. Do this very slowly. Very slowly. Don't do this fast at all. Just pass. See if you can get it to rest right by your shoulder. Pass. Nice and relaxed. And we do an opposite stick grab and pass it. or same stick and pass. Now you can also know if you do an opposite side, you're stuck, like your hands actually freeze the nunchuck. So you can do spins, There's, there are advantages to it for sure. And if you do the uh, same stick grab, well it stays in motion or it'll just kind of flop around. So if you are looking to stop the motion, you're going to want to do an opposite stick pass. If you're wanting to keep the momentum going fast, you do a same stick pass. There's actually an advantage and a disadvantage to both. You can even see just the way that it, just the way it looks. It has a different vibe to it. Okay? So once you get really good at that, you should be easily able to go from here, and you're doing the pass, and then we're just turning around with it. But as you can see, it's that same style of pass that we've been working on here, except we're just not bouncing it. And of course, if you know that pass, you can take them out and return back to where you stood. So if you do this pass, you can do the fake, <coughs> which will reverse the direction of the rotation and allow you to do the next move that we're going to work on. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Again, let's try this one more time though first before we go into the second move. Spinning it counterclockwise. One, turn 180 degrees. Two, do the pass. Three, turn 180 degrees. Four, put it in your hand again. On your right hand again. Again. One, two, three, four. Now you can move with it. I don't have to stand still. I recommend you move with it. So anytime it's moving this direction in your right hand, counterclockwise, you can do it this way. If you're doing it with your left hand, it's just, of course, everything is the opposite. Boom, like that. Again, one, two, three, pass. See? We reverse it. Do it with the right hand, reverse it, do it with their left. So uh, practice it with both your left and your right, and then we're going to work the other one. Okay, we'll work it. We'll work it off this too. We'll put it into a combo. So we're going clockwise, or we're going counterclockwise. I'm sorry, and we go for the pass, but this time we bounce it and we return back. So we just came back the way we went because we bounced it. Now we're in the opposite direction. It's spinning clockwise instead of counterclockwise. This move's a little bit trickier, but here's what it looks like, essentially. Like that, okay? The hardest part about this move is um, going to be getting your elbow to rotate over your head. So what I want you to do is to practice this move without it spinning. 
First, we're going to turn 180 degrees. Second, we're just going to take the check and we're going to rest it on our shoulder like this. Now here's the part that I want you to work on. Your head is going to go through this space in here. So imagine that the back of your hand is going to roll behind your head, and it's going to create this space. Do you see how it creates this little triangular space that your head will slip through, like this. Once it slips through it, you're going to turn into it. So, turn 180 degrees, lift your hand up to your shoulder, like this. It's not spinning right now, of course. Now, see how I'm creating this space for my head to slip through, like that, and down. You can also extend your arm out a little bit more, like this. It's actually easier. The, it'll look better, though. If, it'll look better and feel better if you keep it tight in your body and roll it through that way. Um, you can practice, though, with your arms out wider when you first start. Here's what it'll look like. Here's what it looks like tighter. Slightly different effect. So next, very last thing we're going to do, of course, is we're going to do it with rotations. We're going to move it. It's going to be rotating. As soon as it comes here, it's just going to do one rotation over like that. So it's here, rotate, and over. So again, once it hits about 3 o'clock, we're going to start it off. Rotate and over. Once it hits right here, 3 o'clock, 3 o'clock right there, we're bringing it through. 3 o'clock, we're taking it through the elbow and turning around. Of course, be able to do it with both your hands. First, we're just going to lift it through here, throw the elbow through, and turn into it. Turn, bring it up to your shoulder, create the space, elbow through, turn into it. Once you do that, you have access to, no matter how it's spinning, as long as you're in a front grip, you'll always be able to turn with it. It's in my left hand and it's spinning the same direction. If it's in my right hand, it's going to be the opposite pass. If we rotate it, it's going to be the exact opposite. See that? Um, for the second pass, of course, you can always walk through with it, just like the other one. We can keep moving with it. So now you have complete access. No matter which direction, which way it's spinning, you can always get out of it. Wonderful, right? <laughs> I love that move. Practice that left and right, um, and just keep doing it. I mean, this is great. Now you have access to where you can create lines and walk back and forth with it. You can either do it with figure eights, or now you can do it with these circular spins. So another good move that you can use is something called, a, I call it a collapse. Um, if you have a shorter chain like this, if it's shorter, it'll work better. And if you have a heavier chuck, it'll work better than if you're using a lightweight chuck. Um, We'll do it with a lightweight, though, just to make it easier, but I will show it to you on a heavier one, too. The reason why I say a heavier works better for this particular move is because you can feel the weight a little bit easier. Being able to feel the weight will allow you to know exactly when to stop it and to pull it in and out. On a lightweight, it still works. It's just a little bit flimsier is all. First thing you want to work on, though, when you're using a chuck is to be able to basically First, we're kind of trying to rotate it back and forth like this. I want to be able to get it to hold itself exactly as if I was holding it with another hand, except for we're going to let it float in the air like this. It's almost like a half moon. Like that, okay? Here. See if you can just kind of straighten. I'm pointing my hand and I'm moving it in a half moon. If I didn't have my hand, it kind of looks like I'm moving it in a half moon. Like that. Half moon, half moon. But I'm not letting it shoot up in the air. I'm kind of pointing it to where it can, it can point sideways. The moment I feel it hit that point where they're both sideways, I'm going to pull it back. And these three fingers are going to open, the chuck's going to start flying, and I'm going to grab it, and it's going to end that way. So step one, first figure out how you can kind of keep it up in a straight line like this. Ground, up. Step two, the moment it comes in a straight line, I'm going to pull it back. See how it's kind of like a lever? It's almost like, it's almost like the rotation point is in the center of the chuck. Zoom, like that. That's going to cause it to arc back, and then your hand's going to open up. 
If you have short chain, it'll be a really tight, it'll be a really tight collapse like this, see? Um, but since we have long chain, it may not be perfect. And that's perfectly okay. Because uh, what you lose when you have a short chain is you lose all the ability to do chain manipulations. And we definitely like our chain manipulations here. So it's really good that you do have a longer one. However, with stalls, which are being able to stop the chuck, and with your collapse, the shorter is actually a little bit better for this. Like I said, like every chuck has its like pros and cons. Um, but it's still important to learn this move. So we give it like a float and we pull it in. Once we pull it in, it's almost like we're gonna shoot it out, like, like a javelin almost. These three fingers are gonna open up and we're gonna push it back out. So stall, pull back, grab it with your fingers, push it through, out. I don't use this very often, but it is good to know. It's good, it's kind of like the clutch. It's a good way to stop it. Say we're doing our reverse figure eights in the end. As we're doing the reverse figure eight, I can pull it up into that float move. So reverse figure eight, float it up, and then collapse it. And then we're good. Maybe we're done. <laughs> or maybe we want to light the chuck. We can definitely, if we're spinning and all of a sudden one of the chucks goes out, because we're using fire chucks right now, we pull it up, do a collapse, and they'll light each other again. And then we'll pull it back out. So let's get into some chain manipulations then. This is called a moon wave. It's probably, when I go to the festivals where I teach, this is probably one of the most popular moves. It's really easy to do and it looks really fancy. Basically it looks like this. So, the moon wave, what it essentially is, it's called a symmetrical crossing. And a symmex is where, um, because of the nature of the chuck, you have two symmetrical sides and they cross into each other. The, that's the beauty of, of this prop is you have a stick, a chain, and then a symmetrical stick on the other end. So let's use that and create a moon wave. The way to do a moon wave is you're going to hold your, your hands out in front of you, both grips, both of your nut, the backs of your fists are painting, painting, I can't talk, are pointing towards the sky. Now I'm going to take my right hand and I'm going to pull it forward sagely. You may not be able to see this. If this is poi, you're thinking of a butterfly. Uh, you're thinking of a butterfly in poi, which is one hand is slightly in front of the other, so they can cross past each other without hitting. If you don't know poi, that's okay. I'm going to show it to you right now, this concept. I'm going to exaggerate it. My right hand's going to pull forward. Do you see that? That way, when I drop it, they have space. These chucks have space to cross past each other without hitting. If I don't, they're going to bash into each other. If I do, they're going to cross past each other. See that? If I don't, they're just going to crash. But if I do, oops, <laughs> if I do, they're going to pass by each other. Here's how it works. Take your thumbs, put it underneath the tabs of the chucks. Or basically, if you have a string, it's right where the string starts. Right there. Now, if I put too much pressure on it, they're not going to go down. So I have to be sure to give enough, to give enough space for them to cross into each other like this. Now, of course, they're going to crash, so take your right hand and pull it forward a little bit. Now let go, and they should pass by each other like that. The moment they cross, I want you to take your hands and pull them up. It doesn't have to be dramatic. Just take them and pull them up, and then what they're going to do is they're going to bounce upwards. All you have to do from there is just close your hand. So, one is, the, okay. one is your hand goes slightly forward. Two is you open your thumbs. Three is you pull it up, and four is you grab that's four steps, but really it's a, it's a quick move. It looks like this. So if I counted it slowly, the one, two, three, four, you don't really want to think in four steps. Otherwise you'd be like, one, two, three, four. <laughs> but I guess I have to break it all down. So one, two, three, four. And it lifts up like that. So push it forward, drop it down, lift it up. Again, drop it down. The moment they cross, you pull up and you lift it up and it'll land right in your hands and you close it. To get out, you do the exact same thing and it opens itself up. Again, from here, pull it forward, drop it down. As soon as they cross, lift it up and close your hands. As soon as it crosses, lift it up, close your hands. Boom. Boom. Moon wave. Now, I'm going to show another variation of the moon wave. 
we're going to start with our hand down by our waist. We're going to have our thumbs on the tab. This time, we're just going to pull our hand up, and it's going to basically, we're going to moon wave ourselves up to the top, like this. The way it works is really, the nice thing about this moon wave is, you don't have to, you don't have to like, uh, bounce it up and down. You basically just open up your hands, and the momentum of pulling it up is going to automatically cause it to, to fly into your hands. So all you have to do basically, without this, all I have to do is open my hands, pull it up, I'll do it in slow motion, I open my hands, I pull it up, and I close it, because as I'm pulling it up, that momentum of just pulling it straight up is going to cause them to cross into each other. So, I'm here, see that? See how all I have to do is lift my hands and they just float into my hands? So all I have to do is close, right here. So here, up. Again, here, up. When do we do it? This We can do this time, anytime we're doing our, uh, anytime we're doing rips, here, here. Just switch your grip, and then we can do this move. Now, once you cross and you're at the very top, the secret to getting out of this is you're actually going to take your thumbs and when you open your hands, your thumbs are going to exaggerate and they're going to pull outwards like a triangle. It's going to have this like triangular pull. So from down, pull it up and catch. Once you're here, I'm going to open my hands and there may not be enough, there may not be enough momentum or pressure as we're going down, so we're taking our thumbs and we're kind of pushing a little bit of pressure on the outsides. And what will happen, even if my hands are open, if you notice, if my thumbs pull out, the chucks just kind of straighten themselves out like that on their own. With that extra momentum, it should be a piece of cake right there. And the last moon wave variation that I want to show you is we're doing our moon wave like this. Don't think that you have to catch it all the time. You don't have to catch it all the time. You can do something called a dribble like that. And the dribble is basically where you would catch it, you just hit it again with your palm. So now you can catch it if you want, or you can bounce it and do a little dribble, like so. Um, most common mistake for error is just not having enough space and they crash into each other. That's really it. The rest of it is just going to float in your hands as long as you give it that little bit of a tug. So you know the figure eight wrist roll, right? Figure eight wrist roll is we're spinning with our right hand if we're going counterclockwise. Every time it hits 12 o'clock, we cross over, remember? This is our figure eight. Every time it hits 12 o'clock, you cross over. The wrist roll part is every time it hits six o'clock, we do a wrist roll. So we're at 12 o'clock, boom, we're six o'clock, so we wrist roll. We go to 12 o'clock, we change. We go to six o'clock, it's a wrist roll. Goes back up to 12, we change. Go to six o'clock, we do a wrist roll. Okay, so let's get into the figure eight wrist roll. First, you're gonna to wanna to be in a back grip. So since we're not used to doing back grips, let's say we're doing a figure eight regularly. Let's say we're doing our figure eight wrist rolls regularly, right? Once we're back to our front grip, all we're going to do is kind of like, we're going to do a tuck, like this. Now we're going to let it go, and we're going to let it go, and we're going to spin it clockwise. So, we're doing our figure eight wrist roll, figure eight wrist roll, tuck. Then we're going to, we're going to release it, and we're going to let our hands spin clockwise. Once that happens, we're going to do a wrist roll so we have it in a back grip. There's a lot of ways we can actually do it. I mean, we can do it from rips, too, right here and we're in a, in a reverse grip as well. But for now, I'm just trying to find a good transition point, and I think the best one right now is to use the clutch, since you know it, and then to pull it back out, and then you're reversing the direction of the spin so you can wrist roll it. Now, once we're in a back grip, you remember uh, the idea of a reverse figure eight wrist roll is every time it hits six o'clock, it crosses over to the other side. So six o'clock, crosses over, cross, cross, Cross. Every time it's 6 o'clock, it crosses over. That means, obviously, the reverse. Every time it hits 12 o'clock is when we do a wrist roll. So, we do the clutch, we reverse our spin, we do a, a hand roll. And the very first thing, and this is actually probably the hardest thing, is our pinky finger is now leading. So, we're going to slash up like this. Once we hit 12 o'clock, our hand is going to wrist roll. Now we're in a front grip. It's going to come down, it's going to slash up, and once we hit 12 o'clock, it's going to wrist roll back into a back grip. The most awkward part is the part that I'm starting with. I figure that way you can just work this. Because once we're in this grip, the slash, as you look, kind of looks a little bizarre. It kind of looks like you're, you're leading with your pinky finger upwards, like that. But as we do that, it's actually a really seamless transition straight into that wrist roll right there. So clutch, spin 
here. You can make a big swooping circle and then do the wrist roll, 6 o'clock, wrist roll at, at 12, move at 6, wrist roll at 12, move at 6, wrist roll at 12. It looks like this. Now I think I almost always add an extra beat to all of my wrist rolls. So if you see me go beat and then do a wrist roll, you don't have to do that. I just prefer it. Like that. So here's something nice that you may have noticed then. If we're doing the front wrist roll, clutch, reverse. It's really easy to get into it. And if you want to do the other one, do you remember do you remember this where we're going like doing this tricep bounce? If you're doing the reverse figure eight wrist roll, you can take it into a tricep bounce. Um, it's it's the exact same thing. My arm is going out and it's bouncing, except for I'm not turned this way, I'm just kind of turned to the side. And then we can go back to the forward wrist roll. So forward wrist roll, clutch, reverse, backwards wrist roll, tricep bounce. Forward wrist roll, clutch, reverse. Backwards wrist roll, tricep bounce. Wonderful thing about the wrist rolls, and we'll get into this once you get the reverse figure eight wrist roll, we're going to connect them together. And what you'll have is the ability to move any direction that you want. And you can just use little bounces. All this is just a reverse figure eight wrist roll here, and a forward fit, uh, wrist roll here. This whole thing was nothing but figure eight wrist rolls and reverse figure eight wrist rolls. Again. Wrist roll, reverse, forwards, backwards, forwards, forwards, bounce, backwards. There's that over the shoulder move. See? So much opens up. But first you have to be able to get the reverse figure eight wrist roll, and then we're going to start working on connecting them together. Practice, practice, practice both sides. One last time, just so we got it. Wrist roll, slash up. Once you hit 12 o'clock, wrist roll. Once you hit 6 o'clock, slash up, wrist roll. Once we hit down here, slash up, wrist roll, slash up, wrist roll, slash up, wrist roll. Do on both sides, and you will be gold. So my camera is actually overheating, and uh, it's not going to last too much longer, and I'm running out of space, so I have to make this short. Um, so I'm going to show you one combo, and then we'll be calling it. Okay, so there's one last combo I want to show you. This, my camera is actually overheating, and it's shut off already, so I may not be able to get this, but um, hopefully we'll have enough time to get this again. With our right hand, we're going to do, in the front grip, we're going to do a wrist roll, we're going to pull it back, wrist roll, and we're going to pull it to the front, wrist roll, and we're going to grab it. Just, it's basically the figure eight wrist roll that we've been working on right here, right? So we're going to start it again here. Front grip, wrist roll, wrist roll, wrist roll, grab. And we're going to rip, rip. We're going to rip it twice. On the third rip, we're going to rip it right into a wrist roll here. We're going to pull it back, wrist roll, and wrist roll. So rip, rip, wrist roll, wrist roll, wrist roll, rip, rip, wrist roll, wrist roll, wrist roll, rip, rip, wrist roll, wrist roll, wrist roll. We're basically doing front to front uh, forward wrist rolls with both of our hands. It gives us a lot of, uh, gives us a lot of uh, movement, a lot of advantage. One, two, three, rip, rip, one, two, Three. Now here's one more thing. You can adjust the rips. For instance, you don't have to do a rip here. You can move your hand while you're doing a rip. Do like this. Boom. We can go to the sides with rips. We can do any rips. I'll get more into that into more detail later. But for now, what I want you to do is start working your rips and see if you can move your hands while you're doing the rips. See if you can start adjusting it. And you'll realize you'll change the way that the rips even look simply by moving your hand. So wrist roll, wrist roll, wrist roll, rip, rip, wrist roll, wrist roll, wrist roll, rip, rip. Work on that combo. It's pretty awesome and it's really good for your wrist rolls. Um, I'm going to have to make this quick. We've got more to show. There's so much more I want to show you. But practice, practice, practice that figure eight wrist roll. And also, um, don't forget nunchakutricks.com. Show this with everyone. I want to get 100 new chuckers. I'm really excited to see like what's around the corner. And uh, keep spinning. Work on these moves. So much around the corner. It's going to be awesome.